thank you everyone for coming. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, my brother-in-law, talking of what uh, Isaac mentioned in his announcement, sent me a message from the UK a few hours ago. It goes like this. If anyone is interested, a friend of mine bought a ticket for the World Cup rugby in France without realizing the date for the Springbok versus Ireland coincides with his own wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> if you know of anyone who is free and wants to go to this place, it is uh, at St. George's Cathedral, Cape Town, 23%. Why did you laugh? <laughs> you laughed because you realized Oh, now I see. <laughs> it's not the same as I thought. It is what the Germans call the aha erlebnis. In other words, that realization when in life you suddenly see, oh, life is not exactly what I thought it was. It doesn't work the way I thought it would. Uh, apparently, Oprah Winfrey made this aha moment famous, she didn't invent it. She spoke of that realization that you get insight into life where your hair on your arms suddenly stand on end. Now, how do you do that? That's what I would like to talk about briefly today. And that is the idea of, call it the anatomy of reform in South Africa. We had a very good talk by uh, Fred Robinson and Baron Khanshi this morning in the first session in which they made the point that it starts small. And uh, how do we reform? We all must take ownership. And I thought about this when I prepared this book. And I started my research. Because the previous one, the previous one had the ambitious title of uh, South Africa Can Work. And uh, the literary fundi amongst you will enjoy my colleague John Mayer's remark when he said, South Africa can work. I'm so glad to hear Francis finally tried his hand at fiction. <laughs> <laughs> the point being, it is not fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, there's in fact a way that South Africa can work. We heard this morning it works partly, but it can work 100% close to that. So what I thought about was, how do we change the politics in South Africa so that the economy can work? Because that's what this book is about. It's called, Help Yourself South Africa, How Ordinary Citizens Can Reform Our Local Economy. And my thinking started when I said to myself, Cyril is not going to solve it. I think that's been said one or two or three times this morning already. The government is not responsible to drive the machine of the economy. Believe it or not, most people in South Africa actually think so. And it is not the case. It made me realize that rational talk, you can't go to the government and talk and persuade the government to change the way we work. We've tried that, and it's not worked. So what I thought about was a metaphor for change. And a very good one was uttered by Deng Xiaoping some decades ago when he decided to reform China. He said, Everybody knows the one where he said, a cat can be white or black as long as it catches mice. That was, you might as well, you know, make friends with the enemy. Let's try out this capitalism thing and see what happens. And what he decided to do in order to try out the free market concept, the, the Western liberal economy concept, was he decided to create what he called special economic zones, I think. 
what I would like to say are free market zones. And at that stage, you must know China's economy was in dire straits. And he, he had a poetic expression, a beautiful expression in describing the venturing into this new world of the free market zones in his country, which he strikingly described as crossing the river, feeling the stones one at a time. That is what we have to do. We have to do little steps and bring about big changes. Now, what I would like to explain is how that worked. First of all, in China, the World Bank said the SEZs, so these special economic zones and industrial clusters have made crucial contributions to China's success. Foremost, the SEZs, especially the first several, successfully tested the market economy. First point, tested the market economy. And secondly, new institutions have became role models for the rest of the economy to follow. Now, you know what happened? It's what we started with, is that our uh -huh, athletes. Now I see, you suddenly, the average Chinese saw Shanghai. And Shanghai was a roaring success. People had jobs, there was growth, there was prosperity. People felt it in their bones. They experienced the, the change. And that, to me, is how you persuade. You, you persuade by experience. So examples can demonstrate success. A good, a good example that is unfolding as we speak of South Africans helping themselves is electricity. I predict that within a year or two, the private sector's supply of electricity under the current law will be so profound that we will think back to this as a, an unfortunate and quaint passage in our history. Because finally the private sector, A, has the room to maneuver and they understand that industrial complexes, industrial parks, uh, housing estates, farming communities and so on can in fact start their own power generation. And coupled with new technology, it's a matter of time. Of course, we pay tax and we say, well, why should we pay tax if they're not doing their jobs? And let's sit back and be miserable. I think the reason is that everything that we have in this world that is worthwhile in terms of practical life quality has come through the cooperation of people. And more in particular, life quality in the last two or three hundred years, we must never forget that, has grown in an unprecedented way and in leaps and bounds. We are infinitely more well off than the king of France, speaking of France, in his outhouse toilet several centuries ago. The reason is because people cooperated in the commercial field. One on one. I thought of a metaphor to describe this because to me there's so much of this thinking of the government must fix the economy, the government must run the economy, the economy and if it breaks down the government must fix it. And you know what? They fix it by paying more money. And that money they take back from us or they print and the whole process starts over. How do we break that paradigm? How do we say, aha, now I see? Now the only way I could come up with this as a lawyer, and this is what the book is about, in each of the individual chapters that follow on the opening part, I thought of an area of law which constrains the economy. One of them is labor law, Bettina here, labor law, which has caused an infinite number of job losses and failures of job creation in South Africa. How do you work around that without breaking the law? You can create 
for example, a housing, a housing project where people build their own houses. They don't work for somebody, they build their own houses. Why should the unemployed and the homeless, of which there are millions, 10 million plus in this country, why should they not be encouraged and enabled to build their own houses? Can you imagine the, the turnaround? And the most important thing is if you build your own house, you suddenly see other people building their own houses. People say, oh, so that's how it works. People will want to be part of that, and that can be an instrument of reform. Why? Because it's an alternative way. It's a relative free freedom from the constraints of the market. So I, I can see that we can show examples. Show examples of success. Take, take health care, for example. I don't think a lot of people realize two things about healthcare, which are fascinating facts. The first is, do you realize that 41% of South Africans by a certain survey, all South Africans, 41% of them make use of private medical resources? That's the first fact, which I found funds fascinating. Of course, most of those people are either employed, which means you must create examples to reform the employment market, but secondly, those people have uh, relatives who make use of employment. And only a tiny proportion of those have medical aid. But they still think that it's worthwhile and it's still accessible for 41% of the people. So I think employment is a portal. You can reform the employment market, but you must also reform the medical aid market. And medical aid is funnily enough a huge constraint. The medical aid laws, <clears throat> well meaning as they are, they've got prescribed medical benefits and they've got a prohibition against cross subsidization. So sick people cannot be, must be cross subsidized by healthy people, which means fewer healthy people join medical aid. It's, it's like night follows day. So that must be reformed. How do you reform it? By working around it. You can do that if you can create a scheme where employees get medical aid in the form of the employer paying for medical services, but not the employee. There's no contribution. The reason is that the law says if it's a contribution, money contribution that's paid, it becomes a medical scheme, and then it falls on the act. So again, an example of working around the act. Working around the constraint which makes well meaning as it is, well meant as it is, makes it inaccessible for poor people, which is exactly the, the opposite of what we want. So I thought of this metaphor of how do we describe, if I talk to you, how do I describe this idea of the miracle of the market? Because what we have here. Look around, these microphones, these chairs, this building that we are in is the, result, is, is the result of people working together on a voluntary basis, on a free market basis, by and large. One on one. I call it the bringing together of resources, the wood, the stones, the intellectual property, the labor of the hands that work, the building. The market out there that you have to cultivate, the marketing exercise that you have to engage in. When Isaac set up this festival, he had to engage in the marketing exercise. He had to go on the internet. He had to use the email. All of those things were created by private people working together. One on one on one. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that you can get up in the morning and you can walk to your wimpy on the corner and you can order a cup of coffee for a price which is laughably cheap in terms of the number of hours that you have to work for. I thought of a way of describing this. I don't think you get that phenomenon in the Eastern Cape. Here you can enlighten me. Yeah, but 
the British talk of a murmuration. Murmuration is those giant flocks of starlings, for example, that fly in unison. And they somehow miraculously manage not to bump into each other and to cooperate to form a pattern. And there's not a single central thought. There's not a single director or a commissar who sits and says, I will direct this pattern of flying. So I believe our market is the answer. But we must create examples within the market. And that is, I can't go into the detail because it gets, it gets a bit technical. But the principle is we show examples. There's no teacher like success. Now I'm going to end off with this story to show the power of an example. I think it's well known, but it's still worth repeating. These guys were doing maneuvers off the American coast on a foggy night, and it was very stormy. <clears throat> and the uh, lookout on the ship saw a light. And he said, Captain, there's a light bearing on the star of power. And the captain said, advise that uh, ship that uh, you must change course 20 degrees. And out went the signal. And back came the answer, well, no. We advise you change course to it. And so it went to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, until the captain finally lost his cool. And he said, tell that ship that this is uh, a battleship of the U.S. Navy, and we advise you change course 20 degrees. And back came the reply, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> now, what happens there is the Ohio news. But something else happens. Something else happens is that is because the captain realized how the world worked, he experienced it in his bones. He changed course. And that's what I would like to see. Let us change course in South Africa.